question, what are infinity stones? A whole lot of information and ideas and what I like to call little clues speckled around the place. And who is the man in the purple chair? He's purple. He's a magic glove. Doesn't like standing up. Fury, what does he really know? And is Fury his real name or is it actually pronounced furry? Little Mjolnir here. <laughs> A pair of sunglasses in case it gets bright on the rainbow bridge, which often it does. Oh, if you lift up this little thing, <laughs> what's he holding? Me. <laughs> All right, let's go, let's go, let's go! Welcome to Cord Killers, our mission to report the intel from the front lines of the cord cutting revolution so you can watch the stuff you love when you want, where you want. And on whatever device you want, even if it's on the other side of the world, Ohio, Brian's son, Choshiwa Do. Uh, uh, across the Rainbow Bridge. It's Tom Merritt all the way from Japan. And of course, that opening video was footage uh, from Comic-Con of what Thor was up to during Civil War. It's pretty hilarious. Watch the whole thing. Yeah, no, that was really, really funny. Uh, I am in Tokyo uh, specifically to test out how hard it is to watch television shows I want while I'm outside my home market, yeah, Brian. Yeah, you, you hear that, can... auditors? You hear that, IRS? You hear that, accountants? <laughs> it's That's that's why it's fully it tax deductible. The single most expensive show of cord killers we've ever <laughs> produced. We spare no expense for you. That's why we even paid the big bucks to bring in Justin Robert Young to join us. Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> How are you? Uh, dude, thank you so much for joining us. We actually, uh, when I talked to Justin today, I was like, I think we'll be able to have a show from Japan. I think everything will be fine. Why don't you join us just in case? And uh, uh, what, but, but yeah, which, which I guess leads us into what? The, the primary target? Yes, it does. Let's talk travel. So yeah, uh, this week, primary target and, and gear up, uh, partly because I'm traveling, uh, but partly because I think a lot of people who've written in have run into this in pieces, and we kind of want to collect all of this issue together, is is going to be about like how do you watch the stuff when you're traveling, especially if you're outside of the United States. It's one thing to try to figure out how to get your TV show on the hotel television. Do you use a Roku stick, or do you want to bring along an HDMI cable? We'll talk a little bit about that and gear up. Uh, but also, when you're traveling outside of the country, suddenly all those services you pay for, Brian, they don't work anymore. Yeah. So, uh, I, man, this is one of those weird moments where it's like uh, we sometimes talk with a wink and a nod about VPN services, oftentimes in the context of Americans trying to access. For example, we got we got in trouble with some uh, some Britos uh, about accessing the iPlayer for content that we did not pay a license fee in order to get using a VPN or whatever. And then uh, also we hear uh, complaints from the Aussies about how, well, they finally got their Netflix, but it doesn't have the selection that the U.S. stuff does. And so we hear about Netflix cracking down on VPNs. But in your case, you are an American citizen uh, exiled for the for the week <laughs> to Japan, and you have a Netflix account. Have, have you tried hands on using your VPN to to access back home and watch TV? Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know the economic market or argument runs. We charge people for the rights to watch these shows, let's say on Hulu, uh, outside of the market. And if we let everyone access Hulu worldwide, then it undermines those deals and we can't get the money for them. So that that's why they want to geo restrict. And we, we've argued plenty of times on the show about that. But what about me where it's like, hey, I'm only here for a week. I'm not undermining the ability for someone to license a series to NHK or or some other service here in Japan. So why not give me a pass? And usually it's mostly about enforceability and uh, and, and just technology. Like, well, we, we just don't really have an easy way to ensure that you really are the person from the United States, et cetera, et cetera. So then it becomes the ethical question Brian's bringing up, which is what if I use a VPN to say, hey, I'm in San Jose. Uh, can I watch Hulu? And the and the fact of the matter is, it kind of depends. I'm able to get Sling TV working on the private tunnel VPN, no problem. Uh, that that's interesting to me. Uh, I am not able to get Hulu working on it because Hulu says I see you're on a VPN, so we're not going to let you stream. And I've run into that when I've been domestically because I always use a VPN when I'm on hotel Wi-Fi. And if I want to watch Hulu, I have to be less secure. I have to turn off the VPN to watch it because it'll be like, we don't know where you are because you're using a VPN. So we're just going to shut you down. Uh, so you have to find a VPN that Hulu hasn't blacklisted. It's similar as the game of cat and mouse that the BBC plays and Netflix plays, et cetera. 
Uh, Justin, what's the over under on if we get like maybe we want to do this live as a pay per view special after Court Killers? If we called the toll free Netflix customer service line yeah. and had Tom tell the truth of where he is and what he's going, what he and, and what he's up to. What's the over under on them pretty much saying, yeah, just use your VPN? Just well, let, no, not let's go with Hulu because net. I was going to mention Netflix. Netflix, I can log in and watch Japanese Netflix. Like it doesn't give. It's not a problem, right? Wait, wait, oh, wait with, so with, your, your, with your wait. So your with, subscription to Netflix carries to Japan, but you can't watch American Netflix. You're watching Japanese Netflix. And I'll be honest. I logged in, I looked at it, and all the shows I've been watching are there except for Star Trek Voyager. Uh, every, every, like, it, om- it looks in almost indistinguishable. What, what, what about hacking the system? I hear. Uh... I didn't look for hacking the system, actually. That's funny. Probably not, because I've had a Here, lot of international right. viewers still complaining to me about that. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. But, but, okay. But back to the question, Justin. What, yeah. What's the over under if I call Hulu and, like, hey, man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm paying you. I'm paying you for the commercial free. Come on. I mean,. I, I don't know if we can set a number because I don't think it's going to happen. Like they, uh, I mean, at, at the level of tech that you're going to get from a random number, they're not going to e- probably even know the solution. And and corporately, they are kind of staunchly unsupportive of VPNs, if not hostile to them, for the exact reasons that you guys were saying. When you are dealing with international rights restrictions, there is just simply not enough in their mind legal cases like yours, although that you can clearly acknowledge them, they don't believe that they are there enough to create some sort of passport or some sort of like way yeah, that yeah. you can well, say. And, and to be honest, I think it's it's probably the kind of thing where it's like even to acknowledge that that technology exists, like in their corporate training, somebody comes in like, I'm going to work customer service for Hulu. Uh, my guess is somebody says like, well, do we tell them what to say in someone's situation like Tom? And and they'll be like, you know what? If if we tell them that, that it's OK, then we just get in trouble for saying it's OK. So let's just let's not teach it. Let's not have it be part of our corporate uh, training program. As far as we're concerned, all of our customer service people can be totally ignorant of this fix. And it's fine for them to just say, yeah, sorry, I don't know how to help you in your situation. Uh, uh, read from the card. Hulu is meant for region locked, geolocated, uh, member of the United States only. And, and in the the uh, in uh, Puerto Rico. I mean, yeah, I guess that's the thing. Is like I I just kind of suspect that they're that they're not in business to help you. Like you, they, they, this is a a gray area of their service that they care very very little about making easier because the entire engine of their business could not, in their mind, be helped by it. It could only be harmed. Well, yeah, or or the little it would help doesn't make up for the harm, right? They're they're seeing big harm, which and, is and potential. N- potential. NHK or somebody coming and saying, "Hey, now!" Or actually, I just looked up Star Trek on Netflix to see what was there. Star Trek Discovery shows up already as a Netflix original in Japan. Oh wow! Because outside of the U.S. market, it's going to be on Netflix and see it's a CBS All Access in the United States. So. If Netflix says, hey, CBS, you need to get your crap in order and not let those CBS All Access people VPN because we're paying you to be able to carry it in Japan, that could even, I mean, Netflix might even care about US viewers who are traveling for extended periods of time because they're like, that makes them want to use Netflix while they're in Japan. Well, but but those are the kind of market forces that make these things get fixed, right? Yeah. Because if the issue is we want to protect our regional partners, then they don't care whether or not you're there for two weeks, whatever, suck it up, go see a museum or a statue or something. Uh, but <laughs> look if look at a temple for goodness sake, go outside. Take, you know, uh, I don't know, chase a, chase a, a lemur around, who gives the rats, <laughs> right? Like, uh, otherwise, if they are protecting against competition and now it's something that they can offer, hey, globally, we'll offer our international passport option. Make sure that you change your uh your region locking while you're on the go then that's something that they will put money into because it means in a super competitive subscription service world you want the one that best fits your life and if you are an international traveler Man, that just seems that certainly one. yeah like at that point like you're picking up pebbles and stones so small like i i, I think we're half a decade before it's even yeah. worth them 
uh, 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 talking to providers about offering that kind of thing. It wouldn't even be necessarily talking to providers. It would just be uh, uh, them risking their relationships uh, and 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 giving themselves whatever renegotiation. Yes, yeah, so, sorry. When I said providers, I meant content providers. That's that's uh, like their exact oh. their their current agreements. I mean, because what they would be saying is that listen, we enforce where you lock your subscription when you get it, right? So if you are an American subscriber, you're an American subscriber. It's basically just building a technological way to say, okay, I am an American subscriber. I can confirm that. But for the next two weeks, in the same way that you would like forward your mail, you'd be able to have a legal way to say, I'm going to be in Thailand for two weeks and then I'm going to return to America and I'll switch it back to American, to American region locking. So you're basically just creating one person's ability to do that. I agree with you, Brian. It's probably a long way away. And what would have to spring up is for gigantic companies like Netflix and Hulu in this space is to have competition that would want to do it uh, and would do it to, to offer a more uh, a customer friendly way to do it initially. But I, I agree with you, Brian. I think we're, we are pretty far off. But, uh, you know, the, the real the, t the timetable is going to be set on the competition. And this pastes over problems that have been around for a long time because we couldn't go to Japan and watch something, right? Like VPN and the internet make something possible that wasn't possible before. It was a natural thing to say, well, hey, we broadcast in the United States, but people in Japan can't see that, so let's make some money selling the rights to that. If we started television today from scratch with the internet in place, it would probably be worldwide markets for the most part. Like yeah. they wouldn't come up with these crazy definitions of regions. So my question and my wonder is how much longer will that momentum carry, that inertia of having had this natural boundary carry in a world where that natural boundary is gone and you have to work to maintain it? Uh, that's a, uh, man, that's a tough question because like it makes me think of when you would, play uh let's say let's say uh, you know a stand-up arcade game at certain arcades it would uh, when it, it rebooted or it showed the fbi thing uh, winners don't use drugs or whatever it would sometimes stay say stuff like uh attention if you're playing this game anywhere outside of japan you may be participating in a crime this is licensed for this area only or whatever like boilerplate takes a long time to to dissolve and right now the boilerplate is being fixed insofar as now people are adding words like and any future streaming form of distribution forever in perpetuity till the end of time or whatever. Like the content providers are asserting their rights preemptively into the future, but I don't see any chipping away of of people running to them to to get those uh, to get more access. Does that make sense? Like, I, th I think, yeah, I yeah. think all of the motion is in favor of P people reserving their rights to charge and do stuff, whatever, not at all in in, in the direction of, of le legitimate legal users being able to watch what they want when they want on whatever device they want. Well, uh, what, if it, what if you look at it this way, that it's not necessarily content creators deciding that now is the time that they will uh, benevolently or for more users or customers decide to give them more freedom. What if it's just a, a continuing uh, a hegemony of all the content creators into one or two global organizations that then says, oh, well, internally we can remove some of these blocks. If we own the end-to-end -end creation to distribution models globally, then why don't we make it a, a great thing to have if you are coming in for, for uh, a Vivendi or Universal or Comcast? Uh, uh, there was uh, a... Uh, there was some talk about that in the late 90s uh, when it came to music piracy or whatever. And that basically one of the proposed solutions was, well, why don't we just tack on a $20 fee to every broadband connection ever? And then all that money gets uh, gobbled up. We just assume everyone's pirating. We see what they're pirating and we, we pony out that money to everybody accordingly. Um, and and that, that sounds like a de facto uh, similar situation to what you're proposing, not so much by government uh, hegemony, but, but just by the tyranny oh, no, no, of no, 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 no. I'm talking about corporate hegemony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, well, so and, like, we just have three companies that are global, which, I mean, I'm sure is, like, kind of Orwellian, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, Netflix is kind of moving in that direction by making their originals available in all their markets at once. 
So even though they have to play the region game with things like Star Trek Discovery, where they decide, well, it's worth it because we get everywhere else, uh, they, they are, when they put out their new originals, as often as they can, making them available everywhere. And they, so they're sort of trying to push down that road to having a service that is global. And when you go to another country and log in, you shouldn't notice any difference because every, they have the rights to everything everywhere. I want to wrap this up with one other observation. For a long time, I have been using my own devices on airplanes because I can carry a better selection of things I like to watch. I can download Justified from Amazon Prime and watch it, and I can put what movies I think I might want to watch on there. And that geographical restriction that we were just talking about having gone away still exists on an airplane because even though they have internet, they don't have internet good enough to let you stream stuff. So yeah. the airlines are getting better at providing you a better selection than you can bring on with you and, and giving you things that you couldn't get otherwise. Now, if you were on the ground, their selection wouldn't be very competitive. But since you're locked in the air, I've had two flights now where I chose to watch something that was on the airlines provided entertainment, which was free versus watching something that I had brought along with me. Uh, in, in Delta's case, it was an episode of Angie Tribeca, which kicked me off into watching Angie Tribeca once I got back home. And on the flight here, I actually checked out Hail Caesar and Alice in Wonderland, which were two movies that I never really had time to, but they had them for free available on a big hard drive that on the air, you know, the airplane had hundreds of movies on a hard drive that they could deliver to you. Uh, would you say in terms of the content that you wanted to watch, uh, the convenience of their uh, solu uh, solutions trumped the fidelity of your selection? The, is, would you say that it was a I case mean, of <laughs> trumped or Clinton, uh, <laughs> you know, however you want to put it, Brian? Yeah, I mean. I also didn't have to reach down into my bag and, and pull out the iPad and, and set it up. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was, it was, it, it was convenient. You're absolutely right. I got to be well, and keep in mind also that's one of the benefits that uh, you get. Part of this is because they want to offer a, a a fancier, more fun experience that makes people happy to be flying on their airlines. So they get movies that aren't available on HBO yet. They're in that uh, maybe even pre rental phase where yeah, yeah. they're in second well, round theater. Most, most of them do not do the first run. First run movies you either still have to buy. Uh, the ones that are available by and large on, I think what Tom's referring to is, and it's kind of ingenious, and you almost wonder why they haven't done this years ago, because it's not exactly a new technological idea, which is basically when you're connecting to their Wi-Fi, I guess that was part of the big issue, is that a lot of the airlines had to kind of get into the roll-your-own Wi-Fi situation as opposed to just contracting with GoGo. But they, they have, basically, it's like the hodgepodge pick from Netflix, like that that random... Uh, a, a big run of, of Netflix movies that are all kind of about a year and a half old, but they might have been hot poop back then uh, or, or television shows. But uh, they're actually really, really cool. And the, the technological solution is just having them stream right off the server that's there on the plane. So there's no latency. It's, it's actually really, really rad. And you get to watch it on any device you want. Uh, it's it's I, I've been very impressed with at least United's uh, solution for it, but I know I've done it on, on Delta as well, that this seems to be the new thing to do with most major airlines. Yeah, what you want, when you want, but not where you want. They do make you stay in your seat. So, so. <laughs> and also, you can't pilot the plane. They and decide where you're going. If, 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 <laughs> if, if you're watching a movie as boring as Hail Caesar, they discourage you from walking out of the theater, which would be accurate. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, move on that to the second Cowboy part. Cowboy was the, was was the bomb though, and I'm <laughs> excited that he's going to be Han Solo. Yeah, me too. No, I could see it actually a couple of times. Uh, let's move on and finish the travel conversation with gearing up. That's not the name; it's gear up. <laughs> Just heading off that email before <laughs> while it's half typed. <laughs> uh, sir, your your segment was proper improperly titled. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned briefly that you know I, I bring an iPad along, uh, and sometimes I will still watch that on the plane. I will definitely use it to read books on the plane. I will use re it to read books in a hotel room. But I have noticed that a 12-inch tablet has become my television. I almost never turn on a television in a hotel room. We we turned it on here for a few minutes because it's an HK Japanese TV and it's just kind of fun to to wander around and see what happens to be on because it's it's a different country. But uh, otherwise when I'm traveling 
the, I'm just using my tablet or my laptop to watch my television. I'm curious if you guys have, have run into the same thing where you realize you've had a four or five day stay in a hotel and you've never turned the TV on once. Yeah, I, I saw it from uh, through a different lens, which is over the years, I mean, take over the last eight years, uh, longtime viewers have seen that there's been a number of different traveling companions. I'm like the, the doctor in that regard. Uh, and out of them, only one of the last eight traveling companions I've been with has ever been the type of person, no, I guess two, uh, has ever been the type of person to walk in and turn on a TV. If there's a TV there, then the TV belongs on. Every single other person, it never got turned on because either, <laughs> just because they weren't that attractive. Uh, no, the, the television <laughs> never got uh, uh, switched on because everybody was getting their information uh, through other sources. Justin, what about you? The only time that I would ever really find myself turning on television would be for sports, just because in general sports channels that air sports are either broadcast networks or ESPN, and those are usually easy to find on uh, hotel stuff. But uh, no, I, I totally agree. For, for the, the biggest reason is that most of the hotels that I visited in the four years that I was a business traveler have big HD televisions and standard definition Program, <laughs> yeah, yeah man. The most frustrating garbage nonsense. Like it just like I would just get angry. It made me so angry. Considering like no, I can watch anything I want on my phone, and and it would just frustrate me to no end. That like just give me the CRT TV, give me the old tube television. If you're not gonna spring for the HD stuff. So uh, you mentioned that the 12-inch iPad is your is your TV. Is it a case where that display is the most attractive? I'm surprised you wouldn't use because I I would use a laptop. It's easy, you know, because I oftentimes want content playing in a window while I'm typing and doing other stuff. Yeah, if if I need to if I need to watch something while I'm doing something else, absolutely, I will use the laptop. But because it's a tablet, it's a it's a little nicer to just prop up on a bedside table and it looks like a television, uh, or even just put in my lap. You know, and just kind of lean back and sit on the hotel bed and watch it. I, I, I just I think of it as something that is television size. It's like a mini television that I can move closer to myself, and then maybe like look at my phone and check Twitter or something while I'm watching the way I would normally at home, which is you know a whole commentary in itself. But I don't even hook up the computer or the iPad to the big TV in the hotel room, which I will bring an HDMI cable. Sometimes, or or and I've tried using Chromecast or or Roku sticks, but honestly, I don't, you know, I don't, I I don't even bother doing that because I feel like having the screen near me is just as good or better, and the sound on the iPad Pro is is so good, I I don't really miss having it on the big screen. Real well, and also, it just, I mean, try to find electrical outlets in in your in your average hotel room, and it can sometimes be a frustrating, painful, awful situation, let alone to try and, and, and have a solution that is every hotel room uh, successful for getting stuff on the big screen. A lot of hotels have their TVs nailed up to the wall, and they're in awkward, weird positions for you to try to plug an HDMI thing in there. It, it, it's, it's just this is something that the investment in hotel rooms that were all built within the last 15 years is just not where people like us need to be. Well, like, and yeah. also, it's, it's, not there. it's so painful to plan on it being there and then pull out the HDMI cable and then look back there and realize there's just no access, there's no plug-in. Like, that is so frustrating an experience that it is easier for me to be like, I, I, I don't want to gamble that thing. I don't want to, I don't want to give it that attention. I'm just going to do my laptop. And it's like, you know, well, you know, picture we're all in a hotel room. If I'm on my laptop right now, uh, I could totally picture Tom saying, Hey man, you want, you want to see if that, uh, if it plugs into the HDMI, you can watch it on a bigger screen. I, I, I'm certain I'd be like, eh, it's fine. It's yeah. Well, I mean like, no, if it were easy, do you want to, or, yeah. Or, like or I don't even want to like even the cost of investigating whether or not it works. I it, that cost is too high to okay, risk know, the pain of finding out that it, that I'm wrong. That's the thing. All right, so imagine uh, 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 right there next to the Gideon's Bible, you had a a a 30 foot HDMI cable, right? And it told you exactly where you could plug it in, and it was easy for you to just plug your stuff into the TV, and that way you can make a new monitor, you could blow up whatever you would have in a, in a tiny monitor, now you can do your business on your laptop, you can watch on the other side. I think that there is a room for this to be possible in a way that some hotels are starting to 
uh, catch up to the idea that uh, people want to work out, but they don't bring workout clothes. So they'll give you freshly laundered workout clothes, including sneakers, if you want them. It's just that now there are not enough people that they would seem to to want to be, uh, you know, a peer tech forward at least at least not enough people to justify the expense and investment of time and effort to retrofit current rooms I, I, when you stay in a brand new hotel it's it's fairly reliable that there's some kind of convenient yeah, yeah. stream you know plugging in solution nowadays yeah, you yeah. can tell this hotel room was built in 1994 because the outlets are all hidden. But when you get into a new hotel, like some of them are hilarious if they're business hotels where they're like outlets everywhere you look. But you're like, yeah, you don't uh, and they should. This. And yeah. they should. Yeah. I'm so, uh, does your hotel know that Kurt Cobain died? I mean, you should probably tell. <laughs> By the way, I am strongly in favor of uh, what Perfect Face for Radio in the chat room is calling Gideon's HDMI. Provided by the <laughs> Gideons. I'm okay with that. We or, should do it ourselves. Like we should just, I mean, hell, if the, if, if the Gideons can rock right? it with the Bibles, we should well, be dropping off HDMI cords. I mean, that would be uh, provided by the cord killers. I'm not, <laughs> that sounds like we're providing murder weapons. <laughs> well, and also, it is a little hilarious for the cord killers to provide a cord. Right, exactly. <laughs> Through every single room. The cord killers, use this to murder your significant other. <laughs> uh, yes, don't do that. That is not a good idea. But you know what you I, should do? What uh, you you know what yeah you uh, you should you should help us out on Patreon so that we can keep bringing you great content like this. Patreon.com slash cord killers is the only way the show gets funded. Uh, we don't take advertisements. Uh, we take your support and it's working. So huge thanks to everybody who supports us. Worldwide global phenomenon on cord killers is brought to you by you. So why don't you join the nearly 2000 people over at Patreon.com slash cord killers and we'll be your best friends. Yeah, we will. Uh, and if you are already supporting us, we're your best friends. That's why we're going to do signals intelligence right now for you. That's right. That's totally why. It's not because it's on this lineup. No, because we're your best friend. Uh, we got a bunch of different apps coming to the the old uh, the old platforms there. <laughs> the Fox old... Sports Go hitting Apple TV, uh, allowing you to watch four games at once. So in other words, Fox Sports providing you some features on the Apple TV app that you wouldn't get if you were just watching normal cable. Uh, NFL Network is finally launched. We said it would on PlayStation View. And if you want the NFL Red Zone on PlayStation, it'll only cost you $40 more to get the NFL Red Zone channel. Uh, CBS All Access launched an app on the Xbox One. Uh, so you can now get Star Trek Discovery in the United States on the Xbox One. And YouTube's app is being updated on every platform except for Apple TV uh, with better tabs and an easier way to find stuff. So if you're into watching YouTube or YouTube Originals, you could find it easier. Uh, and finally, NBC is arguing that uh, their Olympics app did just fine. In fact, that's where all the millennials were watching. Sure, they didn't show up in the in Nielsen ratings because they were all watching apps. Uh, maybe, maybe there was a fantastic article. Let me let me do this. All of these have such great emails that people sent into cordkillers at gmail dot com. Uh, there was one from uh, Chris, who, who wrote us saying, this one article could drive enough conversation to fill several episodes. Seriously, it is just jam-packed with jumping off points on online viewership numbers to the role of social media, the future of content delivery. I started compiling a list of tidbits, uh, and it was just too much. Your boss, Chris, and it's an article from The Verge that breaks down how all of the tech of how uh, NBC streamed the Olympics, um, and I, I, I started reading into I, I liked it enough that I made a tiny URL. If you go to tiny URL.com slash CK NBC streams, all lowercase, it'll take you to it. Um, I, I, from the way you introduce the story, Tom, I take it that you don't believe them that uh, millennials are all sw streaming? I'll, I'll put it this way. That article that you're talking about is rightly impressive. 1,100 people working on just getting streaming out. NBC understands that this is the future. A lot of those people were in Stamford, Connecticut, including commentators. So they realized that, hey, in this, is, in this world, we don't have to spend money to send people to the event. There's lots of things we can do remotely, including things like lighting, uh, for instance. So yes, very impressive, very forward-looking. NBC also spinning really hard to try to say they're lo not losing millennials who were talking about the Olympics on Twitter. But even in the even if you consider the streaming numbers, a lot of that was just clips, 
not actually watching sure. live events. Sure, and I guess this is a, it's an old adage in the world of business that the biggest mistake people make is doing extremely well that which need not be done at all. And it could be that there's just not the demand for the Olympics that quite justifies this exquisite hard work that NBC is doing. Well, or, or it deserves a better vessel. It deserves better ways for it to get out to people. I'm really excited that NBC is touting about how amazing their streaming service is and how much uh, their the millennials were in love with it. I really wish they would have put a little bit more of that out on Front Street. I don't know, before the Olympics? I found the streaming situation to be a little frustrating. It was certainly oversaturated with ads. I think that there's a way for them to get that more organically within a product that I can get to easier. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm with Tom. It's exciting to see that they are building an infrastructure. They should. Uh, I, I think it's, I mean, part of me wants to to, to get to the, uh, you know, the almost the, the, the Chris Rockian, like, well, you're supposed to, you, you dumb <laughs> do, do you think it's your job it's your job to do that you pay so much money for this olympic license that stretches for decades right oh wait everybody's going to streaming you want to be able to have people watch it on their phones and, and, and click into it to sustained viewing from things like twitter and facebook wow that's crazy you're building an infrastructure for that that's nuts broadcast partner yeah, I, it makes me uh, so. In this case, uh, they're doing all this. Just uh, they're paying the money for the license. They're paying the money for the infrastructure, all to get these little, you know, five cent advertisements. You know, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. It seems to me like f for the Olympics. Now, I understand if they're in this for the long game and they want to build the infrastructure for other things. That makes sense. But for the Olympics, it seems like. There's just some people who care very, very deeply, and I'm wondering if some kind of super deep, immersive pay-per-view, four hundred dollar package, but you get you you're plugged in Matrix style to everything happening on the Olympics at all time through your broadband. I wonder if that would have been better or not. But then again, if you got the whole world half watching, then maybe it is better to try to get all those half cents from everyone. I mean, but but you you know what? Uh, you guys mentioned Red Zone with, with the NFL Network, right? Like $40, Red Zone yeah. to me is a great example of something that obviously the NFL is, is is tremendously popular amongst American viewers. The Red Zone is a fantastic channel that grew up because cable couldn't get the NFL Sunday package. So what they decided to do was just have a guy in a studio that was entertaining and fun and gregarious that would just go – to all the games around. So you wouldn't watch all the games, but the idea of red zone was that you would see all the plays that were within the 20 yards to the, to the end zone plays, right? Like I, if, if I had that, I mean, that can go viral for the Olympics. The, you know, the, the idea of just taking something seriously and presenting it in a way that's beyond just, hey, there's 90 million events going on where they're all on your app. Figure it out. Skeet shooting from oh, swimming. No, jerks. seriously. No, 100 percent, Justin, because Gold Zone, I'm not making this up, was that for the Olympics on the NBC app. It was sometimes harder to find, but it is the majority way I watched the Olympics because – it wasn't as well done as Red Zone, but they were trying and it gave me just this like bird's eye view of everything. It was fantastic. But I think the biggest problem with millennials or, or forget millennials, just cord cutters in general of any age is that the only way we could watch it was to subscribe to PlayStation View and then use that to authenticate. Uh, so I'm with you, Brian. Like, I don't know. It should be four hundred dollars. Maybe that's too pricey, but give people an option and maybe it's like, hey, for five dollars, uh, you know, for five dollars a week for for the two weeks, ten dollars or whatever. I don't, I don't know what it is. You can watch the gold zone or maybe give gold zone for free as a way to try to get people to come in to pay, but only making it available to people with cable subscriptions and only getting cord cutters in because PlayStation View can qualify as a as a traditional cable subscription well, to Sling, NBC is ridiculous, too, right? You, you could do it with Sling, too, right? No. You could only watch what was on the broadcast channels with Sling. You couldn't authenticate into the app. Yeah. Oh, really? That's our, that's our on, that's one I, of our ongoing When I say broadcast channels, needs. I mean the cable channels, too. But, yeah, you couldn't yeah. authenticate in the app with Sling. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's garbage. And it, it, it's, it's just, you know, the, the Olympics are built for the Internet. 
It's built for the idea that you can get exactly what you want. It, these are these amazing, explosive, granular elements. And and it, it really, like, this story gets, I, I guess, I, I didn't realize I was so annoyed with it until you guys brought it up. But <laughs> it is just, it's so spinning it after it's done to say, hey, look, we're not a total embarrassment. Millennials watch their phones. Crazy kids. Instead of like, no, your streaming system was garbage. And it was really, really bad. And I hope that it's better in two years for the Winter Olympics because that's another example of these great, big, amazing visual events that people in general don't care about. But you can make people fall in love with it if it's granular and it follows you around and you have a way to keep track of it and have it find you on your television, on your laptop or on your phone. Well, and that's it's the way that you want to watch it. It seemed to be. And again, this is t uh, probably wrong. But as somebody who's only passively interested in the Olympics, who wants somebody to filter and say, like, all right, just show me the last lap. Explain to me who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. You know, tell me a heartwarming story of, of, about both sides and let me agonize over who's going to win or whatever. What in NBC seems to have been doing is the equivalent of of giving you the fire hose of Twitter and uh, not letting you follow anyone, <laughs> you know, like when you follow because Twitter is all the conversations happening all around the globe all at the same time. And that's great. But also, I don't want to hear all the conversations all around the world all at the same time. I want to I want to have other people create a lens for me to see things through. And yeah. I think that's the next level that they need to get to is the filtering of all that. Well, yeah, and that's what NBC that did so well with primetime back when they got the Olympics in 88 in Seoul was figure out like they made a big mistake in 88 by not doing that. And so they fixed that. Now, if you watch the primetime, you get all of those things that Brian's talking about. But people don't want to have to watch a primetime, especially when it's delayed and they've already heard who won. Like you need to do that for the app. Because, by the way, it's going to be a bigger problem when it's in Tokyo, the summer games, than it was in Rio. You know, uh, and we have the example of, of you know, the time difference right now, because Tom's yeah. in Tokyo and we're in America in two different time zones. Rio was effectively the central time zone. Uh, and then you can adjust on either side. So so NBC wouldn't have gigantic time uh, differences. It's not going to be like that in Tokyo. And you're going to want to have ways for people to watch this where they want it and follow events. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing for me is that. You should have been. A, I am. I am enough of a sports fan and enough of a spect fan of this spectacle that I should have been able to easily subscribe. As people were talking about gymnastics, swimming, uh, filter it by competitors, basketball, to be able to say, yeah, you want to know what? I'm interested enough in those things. So remind me when these things are coming up, and I can either choose to watch it or not, or 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 tab it, or I can. Come yeah, back yeah. and find it. There's there's no reason why that can't be there because there are similar services for things that are far less important than the Olympics out right now. Uh, you know what? This may be a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know, t touch on a third rail here. Probably wouldn't mind it if an Olympics app, app says, hey, you live here. You're this race. <laughs> you're this demographic. These are your friends. This is probably the things you're going to want to watch. Uh, sure. And occasionally it's a, it's a recommendation. Sure. Why yes. Not? Yes. I, I yeah. wouldn't. Facebook style feed curation, yeah. I think, w might have a real place in the Olympics. They could even partner with Facebook to like use your Facebook profile to make the recommendation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Side note, by the way, they're already they're marketing the 2020 Olympics here. They're like got p posters up in the subways. They've got a gift shop in the Shibuya station where you can buy gear already for the 2020 Olympics. Like they're they're out there pushing it. Uh, and I don't normally go to the Olympic towns four years ahead of the next Olympics. So I don't know if that's normal, but uh, it seems like they're trying to get people excited about it. So we will see. Let's move on to what is under surveillance, what you can watch right now without having to wait until 2020. And when I say right now, I mean, you know, when the series is made, Amazon is rebooting Martin Scorsese's The Departed into a TV series. I... Oh, OK. Uh, I, I, <laughs> That's kind of how I feel. Well, okay. it's, it's I mean, uh, The Departed was a, a masterful joining of very talented actors and a very talented director. Um, I, I don't know that the story. I mean, none of those are going to be in the show, in the TV show. Uh, so at that point, it's just, uh, you know, some other gangster show. Why? 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 It's because we're talking about it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's why I mean, it's the departed TV show and not 
gangster town, <laughs> Austin, right? Like, uh, I feel like at this point, there is no statistical relevance between something getting rebooted and it being amazing like Friday Night Lights or complete trash like the Lethal Weapon reboot they're going to put on Fox. Like, yeah. who knows? Like, the, it doesn't necessarily, if the movie or the original work is great, maybe it'll be good, maybe it'll be terrible. If the original work was meh, maybe it'll be good, maybe it'll be terrible, and the show will be better about it. Like, who knows? Yeah. This Amazon series will not involve Scorsese, by the way. It's written and executive produced by Jason Richman, who did Detroit 187. Uh, Comedy Central's ordering a TV show based off Swagasaurus with James Davis, one of the company's most popular Snapchat series. The television adaptation is set to debut in January 2017, and new episodes of the Snapchat series will continue to be posted, Snapchat fans, so don't worry. They're not canceling the Snapchat version. Uh, that'll still happen every Monday, even after the network program begins. Yeah, that's smart. Um, I think, uh, well, I don't know. We'll see if it's smart. But but I do think it's smart to not shut down the one stream to open the other stream. Yeah, a lot of times they take these web series and they make them into a uh, full series and they get rid of the web series. So especially with Snapchat, like if that's where the audience is coming from, you want to keep using that to push them to the. I mean, there was platform. I don't think I'm talking out of school. There was a time that uh, that uh, when we were pitching TV projects and they said, OK, but if this TV project goes through, you're going to have to stop doing scan school because that's the way it works you'll be a tv person and we'll all want exclusivity for everything and now just even me saying that out loud sounds so insane like who would right. do that nowadays uh like, we want yeah. you to stop using your promotional venue yes exactly uh I'll, the one thing i would say is is there is uh, a, a a a lengthy trail of dead of shows that have tried to translate literally from social media to television. You know, that, yep. that is a hard, hard, hard moat to jump. Uh, uh, finally, Netflix is teasing the first 11 minutes of Narcos season two on Facebook Live. So that's kind of significant. Usually these teases are put on YouTube uh, or maybe on Vimeo, but now Facebook Live getting into the game and Narcos coming back in four days. Would, would it be the nuttiest thing for them to tease Narcos on, uh, well, I don't know, Netflix? Would, they, would that be the weirdest thing? To well, they a, are. It's not like they're not. Well, no, no, no but they're, but that oh, eleven. But they're minute, not putting the first eleven minutes. That eleven minutes yeah, is yeah. it available on Netflix? Uh, uh, is this the same same characters from the first season, or are they rebooting it with a different set of characters? Oh no, no, no! It's still, it's still, uh, it's continuing the story. The first season ends on with an interesting. Uh, I think I, it's a, yeah. just after Pablo Escobar's escape, right? I know what you meant by that, Justin, but it made me think like, let's just reboot. Let's put someone else besides Pablo Escobar in charge of drugs. Well, yeah, I don't know. For some reason, I, I had heard that I, had, I haven't watched the first season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I had heard that it was it was going to center on different crazy drug tales although I like what, what, once you've done pablo escobar it's like oh what, what's the second most famous flying elephant <laughs> aside from dumbo like, <laughs> well and, and i think there's different stories that that you could tell and uh in fact uh, like who's that one el wapo uh, chapo <laughs> oh, oh well, yeah no isn't netflix in negotiations to <laughs> Come up with yeah, yeah, and completely. under threat of lawsuit right? yeah. from his brother who's saying, uh, or some relative. Anyway, yeah, we definitely. We don't have the rights to say his name. That's why Brian got it wrong. It's just, <laughs> it's I, I, and I'm not saying that there's not great drug stories. People are saying uh, Griselda Blanco, who, of course, was the centerpiece of uh, uh, Cocaine Cowboys 2. Like, there's, there's a lot of crazy drug stories, right? It's just that a lot of them are kind of similar, and and once you've kind of done Pablo Escobar, who kind of took it as big and as far as you can go, I think there is a little bit of diminishing returns. All right, let's move on to under surveillance. Find out what we've actually been watching. Uh, we're still uh, wait, in under surveillance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I guess we are. Let's 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 move from. Let's... Hey, it's early, okay? <laughs> Uh, Justin, this, this is, is what's going to happen when you're in <laughs> Tokyo with these Olympics. You're going to have a lot of, you know, like, did I just swim the relay? Like, or, am I doing it again? <laughs> Mr. Are we Phelps, in the relay right uh, now? Why am I talking awesome. while I'm in the pool? Uh, Justin, what have you been watching? I have been watching uh, uh, Mr. Robot, Senor Robot. <laughs> Senor Roboto? Um, it's amazing. I love the show. It's so good. It's so great. 
And I we're going to talk the... about it on Spoiler End Zone. Or, 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 uh... I, I won't get into it. <laughs> it's very again. early. It's very early, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I got to the point that people were kind of a little hooting and hollering about. I loved it. <laughs> loved it. I like that. Right. I like that. I like that. Uh, Brian, anything else that you've been watching? Yeah, man. Uh, of course, the usual suspects. Uh, not the movie, but, I mean, our usual suspects. <laughs> uh, Mr. Robot justified. Every week, Brian watches the usual suspects again. But uh, out of nowhere, there was there was an article that dropped that says, uh, hey, uh, uh, Netflix just quietly added uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell t- from BBC to their lineup. And I tried reading the book, gave up. Tried reading the au- or listening to the audiobook, gave up. It was just too tedious fell in love in the first 10 minutes of the series. I am digging it. I'm already two episodes in. Uh, you, you've read the book, right? Have you seen the series? I have not read the book or seen the series. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, no, it's a it's a, a fantastic... Uh, as I'm saying this, I'm looking down to make sure I'm not... It's not you're on the lookout pick, Bryce. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's, uh, it takes place in a Victorian England where uh, magicians are a thing, but they're um, just people who studied magic that used to be and just stopped being 300 years ago. And uh, uh, they're all theoretical magicians is what they call them. And then one guy, Mr. Norrell, has like... Uh, he buys all the books, and he's like, no, 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 I'm a practical magician. I actually do magic. And everyone's like, well, nobody does magic nowadays. And he's like, no, yeah, you want to see some magic? And then uh, he does magic, and they're like, oh, well, that's magic. That would be, you know what that'd be really useful with is uh, in our war with France. We should do something with that. And there's another character, a bit of a showboater, uh, Jonathan Strange. Highly recommend it. Enjoying it quite a bit. Uh, the one thing that I'll mention that I've been watching here was uh, an episode of Why Did You Come to Japan?, where they catch people from not Japan at the airport and then ask them why they came to Japan. And the hilarious thing is then they then follow them. Like there were people here for a contest. So they went and followed them to see how they, they did in the contest. Uh, it, it's, it, it was just a, an interesting take on like they grabbing. Just following them, asking again and again, like, no, seriously, why did you <laughs> no, come to Japan? Why are you, why are you still in Japan? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Why haven't you left yet? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it's like taking that man on the street thing and then following it through. I thought that was interesting. Uh, but the bigger thing I want to talk about is The Tick, uh, pi- a pilot on Amazon. This is the third version of The Tick that has been brought to television. This time it's coming to Amazon Prime. You can watch it for free. Uh, it's part of the Amazon Prime pilot season. And I liked it. I was a big fan of The, the Tick from the 90s. I didn't like the one in the early 2000s all that much. Uh, but this one looks really promising. I like what they got going on. Very cool. What have you been on the lookout there for, Bryce? Hey, I uh, got a new movie suggestion. This is a new Netflix original movie. It's called Rebirth. This came out in the uh, middle of July. Uh, it follows an office worker. He works at a bank, and he runs their social media account and has a wife and a, and two two daughters, a daughter. And uh, it just kind of has a you know boring office life. And then uh, his friend his friend from college shows up and says, Hey, man, I got this thing going on. It's called Rebirth. I want you to go and I want you to do it. And at first it looks like this, you know, motivational weekend experience sort of thing. Uh, but then pretty quickly turns into this weird psychological trip, trippy experience. Uh, it's definitely like a thriller, but it's not uh, necessarily a horror film. Uh, I think if you've ever seen uh, Funny Games, which is um, uh, an old German and then American remake uh, horror movie uh, that that uses a lot of discomfort and awkwardness as a tool of torturing the audience. And I think that's something that Rebirth tries to do pretty well. Um, in any case, uh, that is available right now on Netflix. It is an original, so it should be available in every Netflix territory. If you got something we should be on the lookout for, email us cordkillers at gmail.com. Uh, real quickly, before we move into the front lines, I want to remind folks that uh, Brian and I got all kinds of other projects we do, and we like to tell you about them. I am getting excited about a book that I have coming out in March that was funded on Inkshares, thanks to a lot of you guys, called Pilot X. It's about a time traveler who has to try to save the universe and possibly destroy his own people. Uh, there is a new cover up on uh, the Inkshares site. If you want to look it up there, you can also pre-order it at TomMerrittBooks.com. And uh, the update is uh, we're, we're nailing down the colors of that cover, but that cover design that's on Inkshares is probably going to end up being some version of that design. And uh, I got the copy-edited manuscript back, so I got to turn that around, and then it's ready to print. 
and it comes out March 14th. Uh, so hopefully we'll do some Austin-related book launch, Brian. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, dude, that would be fantastic. In fact, uh, man, you should do that whole uh, appearance of book people that everyone does here in Austin. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Maybe we can work that out. That'd be fantastic. All right, let's move on to the front lines. Front lines! Okay, you guys know Nielsen. They rate all of the things. And for a long time, they have been saying that television watching had been declining. Now they say it's rising. In fact, there will be 118.4 million TV viewers in the coming year, up from 116.4 last year, up from 115.6 million in 2013. The reason? They redefined TV household to now include you, the cord cutter, uh, anybody with a broadband connection could be a TV household. Whereas before, if all you did was watch TV on the internet, Nielsen didn't have a definition for you. Uh, yeah, how weird that the definition is, uh, <laughs> like, just to call it TV. I, I guess uh, the whole cord never, cord shaver, cord whatever terminology well, it, never it, took it, off. I guess it, if I could come up with a defense for it, in the old days, if you, all you did was watch VHS, Nielsen was like, well, we're not going to waste our time rating you because you don't watch over-the-air broadcast TV, right? And then yeah. they said, well, we have to include cable in this definition now. And, and uh, now they're just finally catching up and being like, oh, yeah, you know, I guess Netflix is TV. Uh, right on. Comcast's watchable streaming app adds a new exclusive series. The first three series include Cholos, Try, Ballin' on a Budget, and How to Human. That sounds like four series, but uh, is it Cholos, Try? Balling on a it's, budget and how to human, while six others are coming later this year. Don't I don't know, man. That. It's something like that. <laughs> this like, is kind of Comcast half Netflix, half YouTube competitor. Uh, yeah, that's a weird space because I don't know how much money it is there, there is in there right now. Because yeah, for for the level of production. And for the level number of eyeballs you're getting, actually, I, I don't know. I'm speculating wildly here, but it just seems like a lot of these production companies maybe would be better off just going straight to it as a YouTube original. But I mean, uh, you say that, Brian, but try balling on a budget. Uh, no, but, but this goes. is what they're doing is they're 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 giving money to already in existence content creators and saying, hey, make us content. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see Cholos try to make money on the Comcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try balling on a Comcast budget. All right, let's get to our dispatches from the front. Uh, Keith in Kent wrote in bemoaning the fact that he plunked down $99 for NFL Game Pass using PlayStation View as his, his place of watching and still isn't getting to watch all of his Seattle Seahawks games. Uh, yeah, it's almost is as though... In Seattle? Yes. Well, that's your problem, bro. Come <laughs> yeah. on. This ain't new. Like, this is oh, no, I'm sorry, he's not in Seattle. Seattle. He's in he's Kent. He's in Kent, Justin. My mistake. England? <laughs> I believe so, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, then, yeah. I mean, listen, you're, you're usually able to watch it for his, uh, you know, unless it's on broadcast television. Broadcast you know. restrictions. That's what got him. Uh, yeah. So I guess, okay, so you got, uh, first of all, sports availability people are bemoaning in the cord killer world. But also, this was an interesting one from me, uh, or to me. Edward, Edward writes, Brian and Tom, I like to live in the past. I didn't see a single Olympic event without a spoiler. And I'm rocking a five-year-old phone with no alerts. I check the news every so often, and that's my downfall. Is there no hope for people like me? Do I need to buy a bunker from that guy selling seeds? Uh, he's asking, basically, is there a way to live spoiler-free as a sports enthusiast? And it's like, I think that's called living in a bubble and not watching the news. That's that Because just tweak that a little bit and just say... I am a Republican, and everywhere I look, I see all this Democratic stuff. Isn't there <laughs> some way I could live Democratic-free or whatever? I, I I think sports crosses over into the the realm of just straight out news. I don't think it's you get hard to... to say. Like I want to watch sports news, or yeah, I guess what he's saying is I don't want. I want the sports news removed. Just 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 go read the Russia today. You won't see any of the sports <laughs> news. <laughs> I want to see. It's a good solution. Uh, finally, Kimberly, the Texas teacher, wrote back and said, I'd like to add an idea to the reason for the name change of the new Anne series. We were talking about Anne and Green Gables is just going to be called Anne. In part, it might be the distance the new movie from the Sullivan Entertainment versions. There are two different fandoms, those that love the books and those that love the Sullivan-produced TV. Sullivan TV has controlled the visual media of the intellectual property since 1985. I think, in a way, the Sullivan series sanitized drama that was considered too adult 
like, for instance, Anne's daughter being stillborn, parents having to send children off to war, children dying, uh, very young by today's standards, teens getting married, et cetera, et cetera. I'm looking forward to the new movie, and I hope it is more true to the source material. Yeah, I guess it's uh, I think she made the comparison of uh, uh, like Little House on the Prairie. Uh, you know, we think of that as an early 80s show and the property. If you're going to launch it again and you're like, no, we're not rebooting it or whatever, you might call it something a little bit different. Yeah. Well, that is it for this episode of Court Killers. Justin Robert Young, uh, thanks for being along for the ride. This was awesome. Hey, I am here for you guys. And by you guys, I mean your listenership and viewership. I'm only partly here for you two personally. Good. Where can there be more Justin Robert Young on the Internet? Holy crap. Well, I'll tell you what. If you like politics, I just expanded my politics show uh, into three. It's called Politics, Politics, Politics. And now it's on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 p.m. Or sorry, 10 a.m. Pacific time. That is 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it is an irreverent look at the lunacy of politics. If the presidential race is a circus, I'm the rodeo clown selling drugs in the parking lot. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, don't forget to catch Justin Robert Young filling in host of Daily Tech News Show, dailytechnewsshow.com as well, uh, since that's happening at like four in the morning while I'm over here. Uh, he's he's one of the people, including Patrick Beja and Scott Johnson, stepping in. Thanks for doing that, man. Oh, Appreciate no problem. That. It was it was a pleasure and an honor, as it always is. Programming note for you to realize, uh, Labor Day next Monday, Dragon Con going on. I'm still out here in Japan, so there will not be a Cord Killers next week, but we will return the week after. Our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com, and we're live on diamondclub.tv, Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We'll kill your cords later. <laughs> it's very early. <laughs> very early. Hey guys, Tom and Brian here. We just wanted to say thank you to all of our $5 patrons who keep us loud, live, and independent. You guys make Court Killers the production that it is. Your name appears in the video credits and appears in our hearts. And if you'd like to become one of them or see who they are, you can go to patreon.com slash court killers. You'll need to do more than just go there though. You'll have to sign up and you know pledge an amount. But Unless you just want to see who they are. Well, I mean, you can gawk. That's a little creepy, isn't it? If you want to be a gawker, let's go. Up to you. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>